Welcome to Opto Sessions, where we interview the brightest minds from the stock market, uncovering their secrets to success. If you're looking for ideas, tips and techniques from the world's best, you're in the right place. Welcome back for another episode of Opto Sessions. Today we're talking to Trevor Neal, Technical Analysis Authority, Fund Manager and 40-year stock market veteran. As unprecedented volatility reigns, keep listening for Trevor's take on what the market recovery might look like, which sectors and stocks are likely to spearhead that upturn, and for tips on how to become an algo, Trevor shares his tried and tested methods for systemizing your trading process. Hello and welcome. I'm Hayden Brain, editor at Larger Opto, and today I'm joined by Trevor Neal. Trevor has been a trader for over 40 years, having started as a commodities trader at Merrill Lynch in the mid-1970s. In 2000, Trevor became head of technical analysis at Bloomberg and has trained some of the top investment firms and funds throughout Europe as a principal trainer for the technical analyst and beta group more widely. After Bloomberg, Trevor managed a hedge fund in South Africa and has since opened a systematic technical fund, which he still runs today. Uh, So hello, Trevor. Hello. I'm very pleased to be with you, uh, Hayden, and the audience too. Thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to start um, just talking about the current market. Um, uh, it, it, it's an unfair question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, we've seen unprecedented volatility, but have we made the market bottom, in your opinion? Well, the, the answer is I don't know uh, the answer to that question yet. We, at this moment, uh, on uh, Tuesday, as we record this, uh, the market has paused um, uh, and it started to steady up. And I, I think I use my words carefully. It hasn't at uh, this moment zoomed ahead. Uh, certainly it hasn't made a new low. So we've been holding the low uh, for a week now. Um, and uh, we've been holding the low at levels which for a technical analyst are um, levels that we might have expected uh, that if it was going to hold, it, that it would hold. But uh, it's too early to say that um, it, um, we've made the low and it's in place. And I, I'm really open-minded about that. And as a technical analyst, I know we're going to talk about this, uh, Hayden, but as a technical analyst, I, you know, I, we're not really in the predicting business. Uh, we're just saying that at these levels, something uh, that is a resistance level or a support level, but that doesn't mean it must stop at any of these levels. It's, it's a level that if it breaks it, it's significant. If it fails, it's not unexpected. And all our trading and investing is around that. Yeah, um, that's great. So, Trevor, do we, do we have a sense of what the market revival might look like, uh, either, even just in terms of whether it's going to be a sharp recovery? Yes, I think we do. Uh, we've uh, uh, seen a few crashes like this. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose you could say none like this, but uh, where a month ago we were making new highs and now we're uh, in a bear market. And we did, we did that in a matter of two weeks, went from new highs to a bear market. Uh, that is very sharp indeed. Other market tops have been made in a much more gradual way. And uh, we've had various degrees of, uh, of sharpness of decline uh, in all the big uh, sell-offs starting with the 1929 sell off but we've got a, a sort of group of history there and we've got um, mostly those uh, um, events have ended with a v-shaped bottom uh, so they they move to the most recent one we know the uh, the financial crisis one 2008 it ended with a v-shaped bottom it was climactic and then we turned around we turned around very fast and relatively soon we were actually making new highs that's one type of bottom the 1929 crash um, well, we had the crash itself, but for two more years, the market went on down. It went a lot, lot lower into its lows in in the early thir- uh, uh, 1930s. So it went down for years after the crash itself. And then it took a long, long time to recover and make new highs. Now, we've only had a couple like that. Um, uh, 1970s was another one. Mostly we've had V-shaped bottoms. So you might say it's more likely we have another V-shaped bottom than a complex and painful and drifting uh, sort of uh, bottom. Think think of the Japanese stock market. You know, they, they had a bottom which uh, uh, lasted for about 10 years um, in uh, after their big sell-off. So it's um it it's it's more likely I would say to be a V-shaped bottom than not, um, but it depends on how we perceive a lot of the fundamentals which are going to come up now, which which we don't know, and 
you notice I use the word um, what, how we perceive the fundamentals. It's, it's not really the fundamentals themselves, it's how we perceive them and we perceive them differently at different times. And uh, taking, for example, in the uh, coronavirus, you know, if you were to have said three months ago, 10,000 people are going to die um, uh, soon from a disease all over the world and, and 20,000 or any number like that, uh, you'd have been horrified. But now you might be saying, well, that's actually not a bad result. That's quite good and, and so forth. So sort of thinking about these news events uh, evolves depending on how we feel and all sorts of uh, things like that. So it's, it's sort of cold calculation. This bad news or this good news equals that. It depends what we think of that news at that time. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so do you get a sense that those um, news breaks where we hear, you know, uh, record numbers of, of, of deaths from a particular country, are those starting to be kind of normalised? We're, we're starting to kind of see those priced in almost uh, in the market and actually um, the market's almost willing to overlook those as, as long as the, the, the virus curve is, is flattening or actually when are we still quite um, sentiment and news driven? The, uh, I think the market uh, in its own mind is, is thinking beyond uh, the peak, which in America and the UK and uh, Europe, some European countries is with, uh, probably at this today uh, look as though they have peak, but uh, 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 here in the UK not and in America not and other places not as well. Uh, but the market is thinking beyond that. What is it going to be like next? How bad will it be? How quickly can we recover from this rather unique occasion where we've had impact on the uh, disruption of the supply side as well as uh, disruption of demand? Uh, usually it's, you know, it's one or the other, but in this case we got a double hit on that and how quickly can we recover? from that and it's it's really you know it's how people think and they are thinking ahead and not thinking about now you know if you were to say what's the situation now it's still getting worse but in fact the market the pricing the Dow Jones industrial average is pricing something else um, it's a, a, a pricing ahead now that doesn't mean that uh, that it because today the Dow Jones is, is higher than it was yesterday. This means that uh, the market is thinking that everything's going to be fine as a result, uh, uh, as soon as this is sort of behind us and we'll be quickly back to normal and going up and making new highs. We can, you know, there can be things which will make us think that that's not going to be the case and you know, things are slow to get going and maybe look, there will, will be, it will be perceived that the, the countries have become... Um, uh, uh, you know, all, all working for themselves and, and basically free trade has been disrupted, may never be repaired and things like that. So all things can come up and we don't know what they are, And uh, but uh, the market will think ahead about them. But the one thing you do know is the price. And the price equals all the facts, the known facts, like the number of people dead and things like that, plus hopes, expectations, fears about the future. All those are balanced out to make the price. If you know the price, you uh, know all those things, the facts and the expectations and the hopes and the fears. You may not know how they're proportioned, but that doesn't really matter. What you do know is how they've been evaluated by the market. And uh, that is, a, is an accurate thing, which is changing moment by moment as the world changes its mind or, or gets more fearful or less fearful. And, and we see that and we can track it in the price so if we know the price actually we know everything yeah no that's fascinating so um if we are to look ahead then as, as you kind of suggest that the, the markets and, and investors are, tend to do do we have a sense of the sectors that are likely to lead the uptrend yes i, I think um, one thing that we can say fairly consistently and if we do get a v-shaped uh, pattern. I say consistently, actually not fairly consistently. If we do get a V-shaped pattern, the sectors which led us down will be the sectors which lead us up. So the things which are most bombed out and most hated and most, uh, you know, 
despised as investments will be the big things which will bounce most violently. Those that have been dragged down, they were actually good companies and and uh, and uh, say, say like food companies and things like that, which are doing okay, but they've been dragged down by, by the rest of the stock market, will have a kind of soggy advance uh, afterwards. But the things which are, have been so awful and the things that we're really despising uh, right now are going to be the leaders on the way up. And so it's a there isn't a normal rotation at this stage, at the early stage of a V-shape. Now, there's a second stage of the V-shape when there is a rotation um, and these uh, companies have really sort of recovered from their oversold condition and they are actually really badly hurt um, and therefore the reality of that comes through and the better companies take the lead again. But because the better companies have not um, uh, been bombed out and, and not... Uh, been demolished in the way that some of these other companies have. Uh, they have a slower recovery, but then in the second stage will lead to recovery. Yeah, I see what you mean. I, is there any kind of technical indicators that we can use to actually determine when a new trend has begun? Uh, well, um, I suppose the, the there's a. The, a new trend has become so begun. So let's, let's assume for a moment that it's an uptrend. And so, you know, we are making that assumption and that we're not just pausing and having a little weak rally before we have another significant leg lower. That's still yeah. on the cards. But let's suppose it's on the way up. Now, there are different ways of uh, defining that word, a trend. Um, the, as a technician, we don't use things like if the market goes up um, 20%, we're in a bull market. So that's a sort of childish thing to do. That's just an arbitrary uh, thing. Um, a bull trend is, got, is much more complicated than that. It's, uh, yes, it's how much we've gone up or down, but there's a time in it as well. And so you've got to say that uh, for it to be a bull market, it has to have lasted a certain amount of time. The other thing is that it, it can't have just shot up. Um, that isn't a bull market. It's got to had, had at least a reaction. This is Dow theory. And um, so we have the, f the first wave, the pullback wave, which doesn't make a new low. Then we, we move to a new high. And then the Elliott wave, people will say this is wave three. Wave, th wave three is never the shortest wave. And there's a good psychological reason for that, is that that is the wave in which people really realize that the market has changed direction. So when we have the first pull, pull out, like now, um, people are like me, are very sceptical, frightened, not sure at all. If we, if we uh, sell off week, weekly from here, W-E-A-K from here, don't make a new low and then start to push up and then break the high of this, of this current rally, then people, the mindset of people will change significantly into that this is really the bottom is in place. It's much lower than this. I should, I've missed it, really. You know, I'm late entering it. The low was much lower, and here we are much higher now, and there'll be a scramble to buy. And this is what makes that third way so powerful, because it's, it's the realisation that we've really changed uh, direction. But that doesn't come until until then, and that, to me, is then uh, when, when you're in the bull market. Yeah. So I kind of wanted to end this section on a more kind of philosophical point, I suppose. It, it, can you can you truly run an effective technical analysis strategy when uh, we are experiencing unprecedented volatility, unprecedented market trends? Um, and the reason I ask that is, I guess, because if we're using technical indicators that are ultimately determined by past performance to kind of predict or uh, make assumptions on what future trends might look like, is it hard to reconcile that strategy with the current environment? Uh, what's what's your take on that? I would say absolutely not. I, I think that uh, I think if you had substituted the word fundamental analysis for technical analysis and what you said, <laughs> then, then then I think you'd be on you'd uh, hit the hammer on the head because um, you know looking at uh, the sort of dividend expectations and of a of a stock and things like that is means nothing these days here. So what used to be very important is, is is not important now and there's other things are driving it and um, technical analysis is the act is the study of action of price the big strengths of technical analysis and the focus of technical analysis is 
timing, answering the question of when, and that fundamental analysis doesn't do. Uh, fundamental analysis may say something is good or bad, or this stock price is too low, but it doesn't stop it going lower. And But um, the question is, when do people agree with you and, and that it is too low and it starts to go up? So the, And it can't answer that question. And when is so important when the market is like it is. You may have to change your um, uh, you, the way you used to do things uh, in that because of the extreme volatility, but that should be part of your trading strategy. And I know we're going to talk about systematic trading, but um, volatility driven stop loss placement and position sizing and so forth means it deals with this. And it, it says you have to trade smoothly, you have to place your stops wider, otherwise you're just simply going to be stopped out. Now, it may mean that actually the game has become too dangerous, that you can't afford to participate any longer. That's possible too, but then you shouldn't because it, you're, it's suicidal to apply, the, to continue to do what you used to do when the market has changed its behaviour into periods of extreme uh, volatility uh, and um, you know shocking news coming uh, so frequently um, uh, in a way that, that, that we don't normally have. And um, so I think the technical analysis has the techniques uh, for, for dealing with this, but it has also got the strength that it is focusing on timing and timing as you know, becomes much more important now than it ever is. The market is completely unforgiving. If you're in a old, if you're in a bull market, if you go back a year ago, two years ago, uh, when the market was going up, if you bought anything, it went up. <laughs> you didn't have to be clever. You didn't have to buy it well. Um, uh, you know, a friend of mine, he he said, you know, back going back a few years, he he said, when the wind blows strong enough, even turkeys can fly. <laughs> but but we're not in that condition uh, now. Now you have to be precise and you have to be very careful and you have to get it right. And I'm afraid to say fundamental research with its monthly releases, which are backward looking. What was it like last month or quarterly data? It's, um you know, it's, uh, you know, it's two quarters later by the time you know whether things have improved. But I know whether things have improved because I watched the price. And the price will tell me. Great. Um, I th well, I, th I think we've kind of nicely touched on some underlying principles that govern the way that you ultimately think about money and, 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 man and manage money. Um, so I, I did want to dig into your investment philosophy here. Um, are there any underlying principles that have governed your style since you moved into money management? Um, I wonder whether any immediately sprung to mind. Yes, I, I um, have. I've been around for a long time, as you said at the beginning, Hayden. And I've, I've worked, uh, you know, uh, Merrill Lynch and other brokers. Then moving into fund management, t using technical analysis right from the from the you know the early days of the PC, um, I, saying one day computers will do the trading and uh, and do all the analysis for us, and we'll be able to do much more and much faster. And people used to laugh at that, and uh, but now here we are, and uh, this is the, the reality of life. Uh, but it's it's um, the the underlying uh, thing that I have realised is, and that I think is 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 important to capitalise on, is that the markets have trends, and these trends tend to persist. And from my perspective, and from my experience, uh, this is the uh, most profitable way to attack the market. Now, uh, what I'm saying really here is, you know, if you compare it to, say, day trading and um, high frequency trading, if you like, that is very, very difficult to do and to make profits from. It is very difficult to do. I've done it myself, not high frequency trading. I've been involved with uh, studying. Uh, uh, evaluating uh, high frequency trading strategies uh, you know, do they make sense uh, as a consultant but I've never done it myself but I have done day trading fast day trading and a uh, lot of trading and uh, when I was in Johannesburg for example that um, uh, the hedge fund that uh, we had there we were doing uh, uh, three percent about on some days three percent of the daily turnover of the Johannesburg stock exchange as just one fund and we were day trading so I've done it, and um, but it's really hard. It's really, really hard and exhausting and difficult uh, thing to do. And for, for me, much easier thing to do is to recognise the trend 
and to work with the trend. Don't try and buy at the low. Don't try and sell at the high. Find the trend and use what you know about the trend. The trend goes up and, and down in zigzags and um, participate in those zigzags at opportune levels with a clear strategy. Yeah, so maybe another way of, of kind of making that even easier. And, I, and I've worked with you before and, and heard you speak at previous events. And um, I've got a quote here. You said uh, traders need to become an algo. So essentially what you're saying there is they need to um, systemize their process. Um, would that? I guess that's why uh, or another way that they can make their strategy replicable on a consistent basis. Yes, and uh, uh, I've, I was an early adopter of this. Um, so I started using you know, moving averages and MACDs and, and saying if I placed a stop this way and but if I did it another way, would it be better? So those were early days of trying these things out. We did that in the, in the 80s and 90s and the computers got more powerful and our ability to do it uh, got better and better. And now we have much more power and much more um, uh you know, powerful things that we can do with our computers. But um, in principle, uh, what we're trying to do, and I think this is very important, what I'm trying to do is to uh, replicate the way I trade in a systematic rule-based method. Now, this differentiates me, I think, from a quant. A quant starts with the mathematics and then applies it to the market. The mathematics, which is very elegant and sophisticated, and I've seen this because I've been, as I say, I've been a consultant uh, looking at the viability of some of these uh, strategies. And, we, and I work, you know, the guy who's devised it is a double first from Mass, worked under Professor So and So, um, and from Cambridge, and his is his first job. And here's a hedge fund. What do you think? And then you look at it and you say, well, okay, it doesn't make sense. You know, it's, there's no sense to what he's doing. And, and they don't have that sort of knowledge of the markets. I think you should do things that uh, make sense. Like, for example, uh, what makes sense is um, if, a, if, a, um, if a market goes up and then starts to go up faster, so increasing momentum, it's likely to go further. If it's been going up for a long time and begins to slow up, and I think many people listening to this will know exactly how I might recognise that, then we could be reaching a turning point in it. Um, if a market is in a has got powerful fundamentals and it's in a bull trend, uh, then that bull that is not a straight line journey from A to B. There's a zigzagging pattern. In it. If the zags, if the pull uh, pullbacks are of a particular type, they're weak. And we can, as technical analysts, define weak. Uh, we can say that um, this market is getting ready to, to reassert um, its fundamental direction, the demand-driven direction, and, and go up again and probably go on to make a new high. That's a consistent thing. You've got a big edge if you start with something which is basically true. Um, and then apply rules to it. And that's what I think systematic technical traders do. The advantage of it is, of course, you, once you you can do it, you can test it. Uh, you can say, if I do this, uh, then then this would have happened, and uh, if I changed it to that, it would have been better um, to do that. But still, you don't know what the future is going to be because you're working with data um, uh, that is past, and then of course the future is new data, and it may not be the same. You don't know whether the data is really representative of what's coming um, ahead, but you have got uh, some idea of how to uh, tame the, the market. And uh, that I'm sure is the best way uh, to, to tackle these markets. Yeah, so in, in a sense then, is, is common sense almost almost forgotten by, by quants or, or, or similar investors kind of in their pursuit of an ele elegant sort of mathematical solution? Are they forgetting, you know, like your point there, um, if the trend's going up, you 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 kind of capitalize on that and you invest in line with that trend. That that seems from someone like myself who doesn't manage money, that that seems simple. But actually, is that is it those sort of simple rules and obviously the more complex ones that you go on to mention there, are they are they often forgotten by by quants and, and similar, similar Yes. Investors? Yes, I do. I think they, they. I work with these people. I'm not just guessing at this. And uh, uh, I, I, I do courses, as you know, in technical analysis for institutions and uh, open courses as well. Quite often, quants come to the course, and why I ask them, 
you know, what are you doing here? You know, you are who you are. And um, I'm, uh, I'm wondering why you come and join us chartists and technical analysts. And what they answer in, in reality is that um, what they learnt, they have discovered is not really true. Um, the market isn't an efficient mechanism. It isn't um, chaotic and it isn't, it isn't mean reverting. It isn't, it has momentum, a thing that uh, with the efficient market hypothesis they've been told it isn't the case. The market has momentum, it has trends, trends tend to persist. It doesn't um, absorb news immediately um, and uh, and always come to a conclusion, not change its mind. All these things are things that they, they've been taught and not true. Um, and so they say, uh, well, you technical analysts, you seem to have known this for a long time. Uh, even academics are beginning to um, uh, to notice this. Uh, if you uh, if you read a book called um, by Dr. Andrew Lowe from MIT uh, called A Non-Random Walk Down Wall Street, uh, which is a rebuff of uh, Merkel's um, efficient market hypothesis book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which really dominated financial theories for many, many years. The last part of it is he says technical analysts have known this for decades. It's people that drive the markets. It's what they think of the news that and the, the data that is more important than the data itself. And people do strange things and they will get frightened and they behave in weird ways and they get overexcited and they create bubbles and things like these. And these things are illogical um, uh, if the market was truly efficient, but they're realities. And these are things you have to face. Crashes happen and uh, we know they happen. They happen actually quite a lot. Um, so uh, these black swan events um, are, um, are actually rather frequent. Um, I just to explain black swan event, you, I'm sure um, everybody in this call is uh, familiar with uh, Taleb and his, uh, um, his book on black swan and so forth. But just think about it. Can you think back only six weeks ago, could you have said this market is going to drop a third um, in a matter of weeks? Um, as a result of a pandemic. No. No, that was a black swan. <laughs> I mean, you could not have described it, but then it happened, and those things are always lurking. The trouble is they're not in the data. That's the problem with quants, is they assume the data is represents everything. Well, it's not in the data, it's, and we've, there are many of them. You know, they happen all the time, actually, quite frequently. Sure. So... Then to, to kind of act in this systematic nature and, and to become an algo, to use that quote again, that, um, particularly from my perspective, seems extremely difficult. I mean, to retain that level of discipline uh, must be extremely hard. Um, so uh, for someone that's been there and done it and, and, and done it for a long time, as I said, are there any tricks you can share to kind of keep your mind in check? Um, well, uh, I remember... Um, <laughs> I. I heard a person on the radio uh, saying that uh, uh, an American had uh, cut, had, described, had uh, said, admired his lawn, his grass lawn. And he said, how did you do that? And he said, oh, you, you just have to roll it, you have to aerate it, you have to put some fertilizer or feed it a, a bit, and you need about 100 years. <laughs> and, and that's a bit how it is. You know, what you do is actually relatively simple, but actually time and experience is very important. I've been around a long time and um, I learned a lot painfully. I've got to tell you, I've, I've made some big mistakes. I've wasted years on things, you know, all those sort of things. But unfortunately, um, you know, to, <laughs> towards the end of your time, you begin to sort of understand things uh, or, or get a feel that you, you're beginning to uh, get a grip on things. And um, uh, and so that is a problem. Uh, so I have got faith in what I do because I know um, that I, I've got a conviction because I, because I know I've done it for a long time and uh, of course it doesn't always make money it has good times and bad times but it's come through and um, I keep faith in it and I have the, the confidence to do that but if you're just starting and you have a bad run you must assume you will assume as I did earlier in my career that it's all going wrong and it didn't doesn't work and I've done it wrong actually you know time is such an important part of knowing these things and uh, you know the you need to walk forward with the data you have to have you know 
coronavirus events that you could never imagined in your data and things like that happen and go throughout the other side of it. So uh, I, I don't have the problem of discipline myself. I did when I started. I did for many years. And so I can forgive anybody. It's very hard, to, but it's through time you get the confidence. Now you can speed up this process um, by, by learning uh, you know, more quickly than I, uh, than I did, that it maybe took me longer than it should have done. But, um, you know, I, at least I, w- I started on the right track. I think the systematic approach is very important because only when you've got the consistency of what you're doing can you actually say it's right or wrong. Uh, if you keep changing what you're doing, you never really know whether it was right or wrong. You know, making a profit doesn't really mean you were doing it right. It may be just random that you were doing, that you made that profit at that time. And so only with consistency and rule-based and systematic approach can you do this. And so having accepted that really a long, long time ago, that's helped me a lot with the whole discipline aspect. But if, if you f- forgive me, uh, I'll tell you a story again <laughs> and that, uh, about this. Um, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, about five or six years ago, I, um, I was during the, uh, uh, we were in a, you know, the early, early, uh, much earlier stages of bull market in the, in the US stock market. And um, I was myself quite bearish of the market at, at that time. Now, my computer program was very bullish and I had lots of positions and allied things, you know, in bonds and uh, commodities and things like that uh, associated with this. And um, I, I kind of disagreed. Now, then the, the market had a bit of a sell and I thought, ha, ah, if only I had not done what the computer had done and done what I felt, then I'd have been a lot better off. And I thought quite seriously that maybe if I were to be 95% systematic and maybe the real genius was in me and that 5% I could get the real uh, outperformance through from my hunch and my feeling about things, you know, because I was excluding it. So maybe I should include it. So I thought, um, now, how do I do this? How do I actually see how uh, I, how much better it would be if I actually had some influence on it? So I, dec- I decided what I'd do is I would uh, write a blog and I invited some friends, only 20 friends, to uh, uh, listen to our blog. And every day I'd put out my positions and my orders and I'd comment on it. But in p- particular, I'd comment on what I thought of the orders. And um, in order to make this sort of interesting and amusing, I decided to um, turn my computer into a personality and I called the computer Wilma, uh, and Wilma being the sensible wife of Fred Flintstone. I'm Fred Flintstone and I've got my sensible pro- wife, which is the computer program. So I would always uh, discuss and talk to Wilma. And so Wilma's getting very excited about the stock market, very loaded up and I'm really worried and I think um, uh, we're going to get this wrong. Or I would say that, uh, you know, she should be more bold on the dollar and, uh, you know, I don't know why we're only building our positions like this. We should be much more aggressive. So I kept notes of what I thought. I did it for two years and I sort of people thought it was quite fun I to know this. So they, when, I, when I lost money, they saw me <laughs> lose money and how I felt <laughs> about it how frustrated I was when I, I knew that Wilma was wrong and she, if I'd done that, if you'd done that instead of what she did, then um, we'd have done much better. But then at the end, I had the results. I had the scorecard of what Wilma did and what I would have suggested that she would have done. So I looked at it and there were occasions where I had some contribution to make and that if done what I my feeling was, I, you know, got been stronger and um, or lighter in a particular position, um, then um, we'd have done better. But also not the case as well, where actually I was way off the mark. And I did discover about myself one thing, is I do get most bullish at the top and most bearish at the bottom. Okay, there we are. Schoolboy, uh, I am still a schoolboy in that respect. But then I realised that overall um, I had no contribution to make. So the best thing to do is the easiest thing to do is just do what she says. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's fascinating. I think that's a message that would um, resonate with a lot of our listeners as well. Um, you know, just that kind of uh, impulse to tinker uh, and to trust that that 5% genius in you, as you mentioned, when really all, all you've got to do is sit back and let the algorithm take care of you, I suppose. Um, so yes. having... Having worked with a lot of professional traders, um, 
during your time at Beta Group and the technical analysts, uh, the technical analyst, um, uh, amongst other places, you must have come across numerous examples of where they um, have decided to follow that natural impulse, um, similar to similar to your kind of anecdote there. Uh, can you tell us about any sort of instances that spring to mind? Yes, I mean, I have, I've, uh, I've known uh, some very good traders, as opposed to technical analysts for a moment. Um, and um, uh, one thing that I've seen is that when those people come a cropper, it's usually a mistake to do with a stop loss. And so that's uh, one consistency in it, that they were very good traders and consistently made money. Then something happened that made them do something um, different from what they normally do. So maybe they'd pulled a stop or, you know, forgotten to place a stop. And then what happened next was um, uh, uh, was that they, their brain didn't work for, properly and something that they were normally very good at, they really became very bad at, and they double up or freeze or with fear and those sort of things. And so I've seen that happen, uh, I must say, um, a number of times. Uh, it's a, it's a, this is a psychological problem, and uh, you see that it, it happens in institutions as well as with private people as well. There's a great deal of pressure, and it can even lead, in the extreme, to bringing down the bank. Um, you know, it's nothing to do with stealing money. It's just people are not trying to sort of um, uh, rob from the bank. Nick Leeson was never trying to rob from the bank, uh, but it started with an error, which if at the beginning of the error he just said, I've just lost x millions because of that trade um the worst thing that could have happened to him is he got the sack well that later that day he'd have been employed by somebody else because he was a great trader and he did what he did because that's what they told him to do and you know until that point he was a great trader but instead he tried to cover it up and things like that and if you think of Kiaval and all the other rogue traders at uh, the root of it has been essentially a mistake and then it's the covering up and the behavior that follows it where people do something else from what they've been used to doing, which has been so consistent money maker for, for them and the firm. So I don't, does that answer the question, actually? Or is that really the question? No, I mean, that is completely uh, the answer to my question. Because I, um, it, it's been apparent kind of throughout the interview so far that, you know, the, the only or one of the uh, truly valuable things that is experience. So even for a, a, a fairly experienced trader to to have a mentor or someone that they can uh, kind of bounce ideas off as a bit of a sounding board would prove invaluable to to uh, prevent themselves from making the same mistakes that you've just outlined there, I suppose. Yes, I, um, I, I think a mentor is... Um, um, is invaluable as you just said this is invaluable it's difficult to get to mentor that's the problem it's much easier in uh, an institution because you'll be given one if you, you know when when i started i was 18 when i started as a trader for merrill lynch and i was going straight down to the floor and they they get they gave me internally a mentor and the guy taught me about charting and i was sent you know to do documents and uh, back office and uh, you know the telex room as it used to be uh, used to have then did all those things and the guy looked after me and taught me and one of the things he taught me was charting and because if you're a trader of course you have to know about charts and I was so lucky that I had that and um, this was a wise man who was uh, two decades older than me uh, sharing his knowledge and that was his job you know you couldn't be a trader trade without somebody having looked after him and watch him and, and uh, say, mm, are you sure about that? You know, once he starts to um, do his own trading and uh, have you thought about this and maybe you should do this. And, and so you're in the institutional world, you tend to be quite lucky in that because the company will make sure that um, you are looked after and, and, uh, and people, you know, good people, it will be their job uh, to, to um, make you grow into a good trader because that's, that's what the company wants. Uh, it's not a selfish thing. It's for the benefit of the company that you do make money. 
And um, now this is not the case, of course, in uh, in the real world, the outside world. You know, getting a mentor is is really difficult. There are mentors, but there are an awful lot of charlatans out there. I I do see that. You know, you know, I made. I've been trading for nine months and I've made 300% or 1,000% or something like that. You can join my mentoring program or uh, something like that. Well, there's a lot, lot of that around. Um, so this is of, of no value whatsoever, um, uh, that kind of mentoring. And mentoring is also it's a very intense um labor intensive thing you know if a person can look after somebody they can't really look after many people you know you can't uh, you can't have a whole business of hundreds of people that you're looking after you can continue to sell them things yes <laughs> but uh, you, you know really help them get better on a one-to-one -one basis is very expensive and difficult thing to do um uh, uh, there are people that do it but it costs you know because it's really if you want good people with experience to shell share uh, their time and their experience with you, they won't do it for, for, for nothing. And too recently, I, I've never wanted to do this at all, because why would I uh, do it? You know, it's, um, it's uh, why would I take up time? And anyway, nobody can pay you enough uh, for that uh, amount of time and experience. And so why do it? Now, I have changed a bit in my thinking about this, Hayden, uh, as I get get older. Um, now, uh, one of the things is I've realised that all I know, I've learned from other people who were very generous people. So, uh, as I said, earlier in my career, I had to actually mentor, so if you didn't call them that, that's what they were, in the, and, and I was taught how to do things, and because the company wanted me to be able to do it, and to be good at it. Now, as, a, as I've gone on, I um, started uh, as a director of the uh, Society of Technical Analysts, um, I was uh, uh, one of the founding directors of it, as, as you know, but um, we have uh, conferences every year. Um, the International Federation of Societies of Technical Analysts is a global organization where they have a conference in different countries each year, probably not this year, um, you know, though it's meant to be at the end of the year, but they haven't cancelled it yet, but they probably will. Um, and also the um, uh, MTA, as it used to, be, used to be called in America. And I've gone to many of those conferences and I've met uh, great technical analysts and I've spoken at these conferences. And, you know, I, I've uh, given, if you like, to technical analysis by freely explaining what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, and I've listened to other people do the same. And we are a group of people, technical analysts, who are very generous with our knowledge. Other groups in other walks of life are very, you know, restricted. They say, I know how to do this, but I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Um, uh, but in I've been to uh, IFTA conferences all over the world and I've heard people say things, tell me things with, uh, without holding back and so that I can learn what they have learnt and the result of their study. So basically, I'm in a group of people, amongst a group of people, who are very generous to each other. And um, I mean, I've done my bit. I, I you know, when I do uh, speak at these conferences. I put in a lot of work and it's got to be good stuff. If you've got John Bollinger and Martin Pring in the audience, you can't talk rubbish. <laughs> um, it's got to be something meaningful. And, uh, you know, I think I've done okay over the years doing that. But um, so now um, I'm beginning to think I should share this. And I have I've, I've teamed up with some a um, small group of people, professionals, uh, institutional people who normally only work with uh, institutional people, um, traders and uh, guiding them and people engage us to do that. But now we've, we're taking people who are serious about becoming profitable traders and they understand that being serious means that it's gonna, it's a learning process, it's a business, it's not a game, it's, um, they want to make money out of it and to in order to get somebody to who knows what they're doing and can help you to help you you know you you it's it, it isn't free that's for sure no that's fascinating and um, and in, in in talking about sort of people being generous with their time i'm conscious that uh, you've already been very generous with yours so i'll like move us uh, <laughs> on to uh, your fund if i can you you run a systematic yes. uh, technical fund um and uh, there will be stuff that obviously you you can't share on this front. Um, but just generally, I was interested to know how the strategy is coping in times of such kind of extreme volatility. Well, um, it's uh, has. I think it's a it's a, actually funny enough a good question because um, uh, the the strategy is meant to cope 
okay, by design, accepting that these things happen, and although you don't know what they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to happen. So there's part of it in there. Now, one of the things that I did when I um, left, uh, sold out my interest in the hedge fund in South Africa, I had a dollop of money and I wanted to put it into a new fund with some other people. It's a private, close fund, so there's no investments, you can't join it anyway. Um, and uh, the, the idea uh, was so uh, that we would do what would be best. And given that we had no uh, shareholders, investors or anything like that, we just wanted to make money. And I wanted to absolutely specify exactly how this fund should operate in all circumstances. So one of the things is, is that I, and before I started trading, um, in the manual, literally it was a manual um, of all the, um, the trading method itself, but in the manual was all the risk management and uh, money management of it, but also under what circumstances would I stop trading? Now, the thing is, most people don't do this until they're losing money. That's the reason they do it. And then, then they're trying to think, is this just a bad run or the worst run I've ever had? But that's, does that mean that I'm actually near uh, the good run that's going to come? Or, you know, and you're trying to think about it and, or has, has things changed and basically what was working is no longer working. And you're trying to think about it while you're under the huge pressure of losing money. So what I knew I had to do was to decide when I had no investment in the market, when there was no PL, no stress on, on me at all, decide what were the conditions that I would uh, actually go liquid, would close down all positions and go liquid. And um, I decided that really what I feared most was um, an unusual uh, pattern in my equity curve, in my performance. So I've got, a, I've got a monthly performance uh, figure. I've actually got a daily performance figure. And um, so I would say that if the market moved in an unusual way, um, then I would go liquid. And uh, the, the unusual way uh, was three standard deviations of the moving average of my equity curve. So nothing to do with the trading, actually not the loss itself. Um, it's not an, an amount of the loss, it's the behaviour, how I'm losing money. And so that if I have an unusual spike of losses in the market. And so um, this started. Now, this is, has been triggered twice. And the first time was in the financial crisis, 2007-2008. To my surprise, it was triggered not because I was losing a lot of money, because I was making too much money. And the, <laughs> it hit the other side, not what I expected at all. And so, because I was short of everything um, as the market was tumbling and uh, the, the p and was, was was going mad. Now, the th thing was, I knew that then all the stops were trading way, way behind and things like, like that. Any whipsaw would probably be very gappy and, and so forth. But the unusual behaviour, the three standard deviations of the equity curve upwards meant I went to cash. And um, oddly enough, and this is, uh, the date I did that was um, uh, just the first week of March uh, that I did that. Now, the second time it happened was 12th of March this year. Um, I was short of everything, uh, long of the dollar, long of, of, uh, of uh, uh, bonds, uh, uh, long of the stock markets, uh, all those things, because as a technician, I had to be. They were going up, so I had to be there. But my equity curve zoomed off through the roof and and this said liquidate all the positions and so that's what I did 12th of March I did that now all the readings have come back to a level where it says you I can re-enter the market and um, now I haven't re-entered the market because I feel very uncertain about it and um, if I if I can use a little bit more of your time uh, I didn't do a very good job either in 2008 because in 2008, I was very bearish after the low. When the market went up, I thought this was a, um, a reaction and not a reversal. So I read it all wrong. I didn't, um, the computer was saying you should go long. I ignored it. Um, then the market started to come down and I thought, here we go. Here's the, the next leg as we go down to make new lows and the whole banking system collapses. And I decided to kick in my um, trading system, which got me, got me short of things. Well, actually, it was that was actually the wave two, if you like. It didn't make a new low. We started up 
in wave three, I became one of the suckers who was uh, sucked in and forced to buy. And here the market's way off its lows and I haven't bought and everything like that. And so I, I uh, didn't. So there was a, a last occasion that I had actually had any manual intervention was how to re-enter the market after being uh, exiting. I've got the same situation now, and I'm fully confident that I will once again mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's just sort of um, actually your inclination in times of such kind of unprecedented volatility. You, you want to be more active because you want to feel like you've got a sense of control. When actually, it's it's the time when you should do exactly the opposite of that and completely rely on the systems that you've put in place. Um, do, do you, yeah, maybe an unfair question, but do, do you have a time horizon in terms of when you think you'll re enter the market? Well, the, um, um, I don't know what the computer says, and I haven't got these positions now, but um, many of the things which are moving very are highly correlated, things that are highly correlated at the moment, as they often are at times of extreme. Uh, stress is um, um, are that the, the this is a the, it, the computer Wilma sees it as a uh, as a weak rally and is getting ready to sell a lot of things on the resumption of any weakness. Now, if there, if there is no weakness, then it won't sell. But basically, the uh, trend is clearly down, and we've got a weak rally against the trend. So that for me is the setup condition for getting short as soon as weakness reasserts itself. And um, that hasn't happened yet. The weakness hasn't reasserted itself today as I speak um, yet. And so um, basically the uh, the computer having exited um, the trades is now waiting to re-enter currently, mostly on the short side. Yeah, no, really interesting. And, and it's the same with oil and, you know, the other things which are bouncing currently. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, and, and while we're talking about time horizons, I, I wanted to move on to uh, swing trading just as a yes. as a strategy type, type I suppose. It's, it's something that we've discussed previously and um, it seems to describe, I guess, your optimal style or your prepare, uh, preferred time horizon. Uh, I just wanted to get to the bottom of what, what it is exactly that appeals to you about this strategy. The, what appeals to me about it is that um, it's built on common sense. It's a tried and tested method. You'd think that people would, you know, when things are tried and tested, they would, um, like candlestick charting, hundreds of years of working, you know, so that, there we are. You know, that you've got something there, haven't you? Swing trading, you know, hundreds of years of working, but, you know, it's a, it's a tried and tested method. Of course, no, no, people don't do it the same way. Uh, they have their own rules and their own methods, and some are good at it and some people are not, and and, and so forth. So uh, there are 10,000 ways of being a swing trader. But the idea is that the market moves uh, within a trend, makes swings, A, B, C type moves, uh, impulse in the direction of the trend, pull back against the trend and re resumption of the trend. And so, so basically you're built, it's built on rock as a, as a, as a method. You've got to tame it by, you know, deciding exactly how you enter, exactly how you place the stop, how you trail the stop, how you take your profits, all that sort of thing is, is, is. but again, what you start with is something that makes sense. With regard to the time horizon of it itself, um, I, uh, when I started this, I decided that my favorite and what made it the favorite time frame for operation is, for a holding period is about a month. So establishing your position and then exiting about a month later, not exactly a month later, but round about a month. So not an hour later and not two years later, but round about a month. Now, this suits me uh, very well. I, it's the area where I think I do best. I know that um, day trading can be profitable, but it's really, really hard. It's exhausting. I don't want to do it anymore. Investing, I don't think I'm very good at it. You know, I, you, you ask me where the market's going to be in a year's time. I'm honest enough to say I've no idea uh, where it is going to be in a year's time. Time, but I do think I can tell you, uh, given the, the appropriate sequence, with a fair enough amount of accuracy where it's likely to be in a month's time. And that seems to be my sweet spot as a person. Now, the, that doesn't mean every, it's the same for everybody, and it isn't the same for everybody. I know some people are geniuses at, other, at doing these other time frames. But the advantage uh, for, for me of that time frame is the best chart uh, for giving you signals and messages in that time frame are daily charts. Daily charts, so a candle, 
high, open, high, low, close of the day. The big advantage of that is, of course, you look at it once a day and you don't do anything else in between time. Now, that is great. I've sat and stared at screens and, you know, I physically vomited in the office, you know, during the day with fear. <laughs> um, you know, I'd, but the thing is, I, what I try to do now is not look. Yeah. There's nothing I'm going to do, so why torture yourself? You've got to stop in, stop, go, stop, go. That's it. That's what they're there for. They're there to get you out. And I have a little, um, uh, it's a big cell in my risk uh, program that I have, and it is the amount of equity I will have less left if every single stop is ex executed today. So I know what the worst is. I've already faced the worst, and then the day happens, and, and of course, very rarely do I get stopped out of all my positions. But I do, I've already faced in my mind what the worst will look like. <laughs> so um, so I, I think what I'm trying to do is make things easy for myself. Now, this is not possible for many people. You know, if you work in an institution, for example, your boss is not going to say, well, you know, you pop in just before the close and <laughs> place your orders and go home, you know, work for an hour. That's, uh, you're there to work <laughs> and it pays you a lot of money to do it. And um, I, but I do think that for me, the uh, optimal whole horizon to operate in is 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 looking to forecast about a month ahead. So, um, in that kind of monthly time horizon, then have you? What's your strategy for taking profits? I mean, I, I imagine it differs trade to trade, but w would you be looking for a specific sort of risk to reward ratio at the end of that month? Uh, to decide whether you take profits on a particular trade? Is, 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 are you using the time horizon to decide um, as like a deadline by which you need to take profits? Um, no, I don't do it that way. Um, that is a way to do it, by the way, and I'm not saying that what I do is the right way to do it, but here's what I do. Um, so what I do is I buy, uh, uh, I'm looking for a trend, uh, you know, and, you know, if, you, if, you, if it's an uptrend for a security, then without looking, you can say the fundamentals are bullish. You don't need to look. That's why it's going up. You know, if you're interested, you must go and read the, the, the report. But um, basically, you know, it's bullish. So that's why it's going up. And trends do tend to persist and they go in a zigzagging move. So you're trying to participate in the zigs, of which there will be in a good bull run. Uh, good bull runs in commodities and, and securities uh, will last years or 10 years, you know, as, as we've seen. But it's a zigzagging uh, uh, behavior. So we're looking for the uh, the pullback. Now, uh, when I've, I enter after the pullback has started uh, to move back in the direction of the trend, the, I think impulsive move is at the very beginning. I've got the wonderful thing is I've got a very obvious place to uh, place the stop, place to place the stop, and that's just below the recent low. And I use a computer to do that. What's the recent low? It's the lowest low of the last five bars. Usually it's yesterday's, but you know, uh, within the last week, uh, low. So that I place the stop below there on entry. Then if the market moves in my favour, if the market moves down, you know, maybe it's uh, I got in and then it's uh, still pulling back more, then I get out. If all the conditions are still met, there's bullish uh, security and the ADX is still good and um, and all the other conditions that are necessary, then I'll, rep I'll replace the, the order and do it again at a lower level. But let's say it goes right for me and I bought the market has turned. Ahead of me, I've got the previous high, which is often a resistance level. And I do think the market is going to, I hope the market is going to go on beyond into a new high. And so we'll have a new zig and we'll make further progress in the bull market. So um, I use the computer to measure the, um, uh, the pullback that, that I've just got in on compared to the previous impulse move. And then I add the length of the previous in impulse move to the pullback, and that gives me an objective for this run. So if you think of it like an A, B, C, D move, where D is the, high, is the new high, obviously above B, the previous yep. high. And so A, A, B, and C, D are the same length. So as I enter the trade, I've got ahead of me this 
hoped for level. Now this is um, uh, this helps me position size because and also gives me a, uh, a risk reward ratio for the trade. And uh, so this allows me uh, gives me a lot of information the attractiveness of the trade. Maybe the trade is 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 not used is not um, doable because the risk reward ratio is not good enough uh, for that trade. I want to put the odds on my side by having risk reward ratios so I can tell you of, of three or more. So anything less than three to one, I don't do. Now, uh, let's say that uh, if the market starts to move in my fav favor, then I use a trailing stop um, to, um, uh, to take a profit. So my exit is always on stop. Um, so when I'm taking a profit, for example, let's say the market's gone up, maybe it's got to the previous high and starts turning up down again, maybe potentially forming a double top can happen, but I've got out of it uh, then as it, as it pulls back there. But let's say joy of joys goes through the previous high, goes through the B point, and so we're on the CD uh, journey uh, going towards D. Once I get to D, I tighten the stop. And I have found, I don't take a profit there, I don't decide at the beginning where I'm going to exit the trade, and many of my greatest trades are the, those ones where the, the next move is really a big move. And what I found is, if the market goes through that point D, it often accelerates. The funny thing is the market gets more bullish as it becomes clear that it's going up. It was, it was hesitant when it was lower, but now it's clearly going up and the, the market may be a wave three type move uh, there and it pushes ahead. But because of that, the, uh, the uh, stop that I was using, which was designed to keep me in the trade, it was far enough back so we could go up and down a bit, but still, as long as we weren't changing direction, I still stayed long. Now I no longer want to sort of preserve the trade. I want to take a profit on the trade. And so I tighten the stop. And this means the, the security's got to drive on up. Um, in order for me to stay on with it. And so usually I'm stopped out quite quickly after that. So I enter on stop and I take my losses on stop and I take my profits on stop. Great. I mean, so that means stop placement is absolutely crucial then, I suppose. Um, so. Yes, it, it is. Yeah, because that's, uh, I do everything yeah. on stop. So um, again, at a recent event, I heard you talking about uh, the use of average true, true range to place your stops. Um, is that something that that forms uh, kind of uh, the basis of your um, kind of technique here, or if if not, um, I wondered whether you could explain that uh, in in a little bit more detail and kind of why it's useful, maybe even just for retail traders. The average true range is a way of saying the volatility of the market. This changes all the time, and goodness, we've seen that. So the um, a stop loss, which would have been perfectly good and acceptable a um, week, few weeks ago, is going to be stopped out with nothing happening whatsoever in the market because it's moving about wildly all the time at the moment there. And so your strategy must reflect the current state of the volatility of the market. Don't forget, volatility is fear. So what is the fear level in the market? The fear level was extreme uh, a week ago in the market, and so the volatility, the VIX and so forth, uh, uh, hit those record uh, levels. And the volatility is calming down a little bit now, as we're getting sort of thinking, beginning to think perhaps that it's all over and the worst is behind us, we hope, um, uh, is, is the case. Um, so we, we have to adjust the stop loss, the risk, level, the amount of risk that we're willing to take in proportion to the, to the fear level of the market. The fear level can be so extreme that, in fact, the message is you shouldn't be doing it because you can't afford it. The market is too, is too big, dangerous for you. There is such a level uh, for it to happen. But if you don't use a measure like ATR, you don't know what it is. Now, once you've, once you've worked out the ATR, then you know what the average movement is. If you place a stop inside that amount, you will, on an average day, get stopped out, or an average hour, or whatever it is, or average five minutes. And so you mustn't place a stop there, because if you, if you place a stop there with nothing actually happening in the market, you're just going to be hit on that stop. Now, you want to place a stop beyond that, and you and by a certain amount. Now, the certain amount is a factor, and the factor is the comfort factor. Um, so you might say that um, I will uh, place my stop two ATRs below uh, the high of the market. 
So let's say it's good, the market's going up. And so far, the high so far is Sonto, and I'll place two to 80, a stop 280 yards below. So what you're saying there is, if the market moves against my position by twice its normal amount, something's going on and I want to get out of it. Okay, I don't care what it is. It's a big enough to make it move twice as much as it normally does. And it's against me. And so the ATR is a wonderful thing. It's very, it's very simple. There's, one, there's complicated ways of measuring volatility, but actually simple average true range is, is a, tells you all you need to know about the volatility as far as you as, as a trader is concerned. Great. So I guess I, uh, a lot of people listening to this will want to know kind of what to look out for next, whether there's any particular, particularly uh, sort of technical trends that stand out to you. Um, and uh, I guess we could do this one of two ways. One, obviously, if any spring to mind, then then go for it. The other way would be to um, you you have kind of pioneered a relative rotation graphs and and that method for uh, synthesizing big uh, amounts of data and pinpointing opportunities uh, through uh, an easy way to visualize a lot of stocks um, on on just one chart. Um, and I'm sure you can do a better job of explaining it than I can. So maybe we could start with a quick explanation of that um, and then quickly move on to uh, the opportunities that you're seeing on those charts. Yeah. Okay, well, the relative rotation graph is, is a, um, a popular uh, analysis method uh, in, in institutions. It's not used much in the retail market because they don't know about it. And also it's, it's geared towards portfolio and uh, strategic and asset allocation type trading, which is essentially most or mostly done by investors and funds and so forth. So it's geared towards that rather than individual uh, trading the euro or something like that. Now, if you want to see it, I, 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 I'll direct you to the, the website relativerotationgraphs.com and uh, if you look uh, on there, you'll see examples of it, including foreign exchange, um, and, and it, uh, it is very effective uh, for in the foreign exchange market. But here's what it is. It's a dynamic scattergram of the relationship of a number of securities versus a benchmark. So in the case of foreign exchange, the benchmark might be the euro. And then in the um, horizontal axis, you've got things which are outperforming the euro on the right-hand side, underperforming the euro on the left-hand side. And so you have, have 100, and then you have something which is performing 5% better, 105, 110, etc., or 95, 90, and so forth. So um, going from left to right, you're getting stronger and stronger versus the euro. So this is the word relative. So something divided by something. Now that's that's okay. So we can say that, you know, stronger than the, than the dollar is the yen, uh, for example, weaker than the dollar is the pound, for example, currently. But the, in, the interesting thing about it is, is the vertical axis. In the vertical axis, we introduce momentum of the relative performance. Now, momentum of the relative performance, not the momentum of the currency, but the momentum of its relationship with, let's say, the dollar, if that's the benchmark in it. So a high reading means that it is, uh, has got positive uh, momentum. A low reading means it's got low positive momentum. momentum. It's only positive momentum that it's got. So what you have then is a scattergram with, with four quadrants. The top right-hand quadrant so the right hand means it's outperforming, let's say, the dollar, and top means with positive momentum. Bottom right hand quadrant means it's outperforming the dollar, but losing positive momentum. Bottom left hand corner is things which are underperforming the dollar with negative momentum. So things are horrible and looking as though they're going to be more horrible. And then maybe the most interesting thing is the top left-hand quadrant, which are things which are underperforming the benchmark, the dollar, and um, but are showing positive momentum. And this is the things that are like the next big thing. You know, you're buying them early, not when they've become what everybody can see the strongest thing. And so now what's the interesting about it, what makes it dynamic, is that we plot a tail a history tale, and we take samples back in time. So it could be every minute or every day or every week or something like that. And so you plot 
then going back, let's say, um, eight uh, weeks, it might be, if you did it in an equity or an asset class. And uh, so, so you'd have a tail. So what you can see as a chartist is you can see this circular movement, this rotation. You, you, say, you know, there is this thing called ro uh, rotation in the market. Well, here it is. That's what it looks like. It rotates and it rotates clockwise. So you're seeing it and you can see the path of these things. And also as technical analysts, what you can see is that the direction of it, northeast is good. That means more outperformance with more momentum. A big gap, expanding gap in the sample means it's happening faster. Therefore, it's likely to go further. And also the further away it is from the middle, that means the more um, uh, that it's not correlating with the middle. Anything which is near the middle near the benchmark means it's just moving with the benchmark. But you make your profit from things which are away from the benchmark and are outperforming it. So that's how you read it. It's very simple. And the great thing about it and why people like it is you can populate this with many securities. And what you're seeing is many graphs in one graph. It's a very clear and simple way of doing it. Now, Hayden just uh, asked me what the uh, what's the picture right now. Well, of course, we've had this uh, uh, bombing out of uh, of uh, sectors uh, and led down uh, by uh, the material sector that was the, was the hardest hit in the U.S. Energy very hardly hit. Industrials also and financials. These are the worst sectors. Now, these are the sectors which I would expect to flick around and rotate. Um, and go rapidly across into that um, uh, north, that top right hand uh, sector and lead us out again. And we were watching that. When is it happening? That's the clue that we made the bottom when that actually happens. So we've got oversold sectors, oversold securities, oversold commodities and things like that. Um, but, uh, but the thing is that um, the, the bottom will be in place when those things flick around and they will lead the other things. So if you only look at the averages, you'll, you'll miss the internal of the averages is how things switched around and who's leading us out of it. And, um, and so that's what we're watching for. That's great. No, that's really interesting. Um, so again, it's going to be the sectors that led us down are going to be the ones uh, that, 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 that lead us up on that second half of the V, I suppose. Um, Yes, and so if you want, uh, I'll name names, yeah, yeah. if you want. So, so the, you know, the bombed out stocks, um, which are good companies, actually, um, are uh, uh, Dow Chemicals. Uh, so anything in the sort of chemicals and fertilizers area. In the energy, Chevron, Exxon, Chevron sinks down 60%, something like that. The world's not going to stop producing oil. We'll produce less but um, it uh, uh, will consume less, sorry, uh, but um, it's still got those uh, assets. In the industrials, Boeing, that's down 64%, United, United Technologies. And in financials, the worst of the big um, banks is uh, American Express. Then second worst is Goldman Sachs, and third worst is JPM, J uh, JP Morgan. Uh, you know, I think that as uh, soon as the pressure's off, those things will flip back into being the best performing things. Right, ones to watch them. Um, so uh, that I mean, that's that's all been really fascinating, Trevor. Um, if if I may, I wanted to finish on uh, some quick fire questions, um, just a bit of fun at the end of the uh, interview. Yes. Um, you know, you can you can answer in as little as one word or one sentence. That's absolutely fine. So uh, if I kick off with the first one, uh, in your opinion, what's the top mistake investors make? I think that um, investors, and here we're talking about private investors, I think, um, is that they come to this business and treat it like a game, and they're gamblers. And it's a lot of fun, it's absorbing, that sort of thing. Take it seriously, treat it like a business. It's not a game if you want to win. Where do you go for your investment or uh, business insights? I uh, have learned a lot and most of what I know uh, from colleagues in, t in uh, technical analysis and the, uh, the main sources of that in here in London, uh, we have the Society of Technical Analysts, uh, which is uh, sda dash ukorg and they are wonderful. They have a monthly meeting, any of great 
names that you're familiar with in the world of technical analysis. If they're coming through London, they speak at the STA's monthly meeting. So you can have Prector, you can have uh, Martin Pring, you can have John Bollinger, you can have John Murphy. If they happen to be in London, they will give a talk uh, there. They they record all the the um, uh, the sessions professionally, and um, and members uh, can see it. It's only a hundred and something pounds a year. It's a bargain. Even if you can't go to the meetings, you can you can hear these guys talk. It's really really good. Great. So uh, number three, then, what's your most memorable moment from your career? I've had I've been very lucky in my career. I've met some good people, and I think that's been the joy of it. Really, the the, the occasions of meeting people who became lifelong friends and we help each other our careers take our roots and um, and um, but uh, still we, re- we remain uh, friends through it so I would think those are the high points meeting those people yeah great so what's um what's the top tip for your younger self then is to understand the awesome power of compound interest great and then a final question then um as part of your morning routine is there anything that you consistently do to set yourself up for the day Yes, I, I, I'm one of these people uh, that, uh, that I'm a morning person. In fact, I get up early every morning. And, um, and so I start work. I'm at my desk usually about 5.30 or 6 a.m. I have an office at home, by the way. Um, and uh, uh, I then do my work around 5 o'clock in the morning. I think it's a great time to do this kind of work. It requires a lot of concentration. My brain is at its clearest. It probably goes downhill from five o'clock in the morning to the rest of the day. Um, and um, I can think clearly. The markets is the one time in the morning when the global markets are essentially closed. You know, we're coming towards the end of the uh, Asian session. The European session hasn't started, so nothing's moving. There's nobody about to make an announcement. There's no GDP number. There's no Trump, even Trump's asleep and things like that. So you've got one day, we one short period of time in the day in 24 hours when the markets are pieced and you could actually say it's closed really it's closed and therefore it's very easy to place orders and to place stops and, and see things clearly because your heart's not thumping due to being going up and down which is not true most of the rest of the day i also my brain is at its best at that time and so for me it's uh, it's the early start and getting things done also some research i have to do it has to be on the desk of my the people I'm working for by seven o'clock in the morning. So I'm doing a technical analysis research and, and it has to be on their desks by the time they get in at seven o'clock. So I have to start early in order to get that done in time. But I find it no hardship. I like it. Great. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for your time today, Trevor. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. Okay. It's my, been my pleasure. Thank you very much indeed, Hayden and, and everybody. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest to you. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during a trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new podcasts, stock reports, or events from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. Until next time.